Hey, well, good afternoon, everyone. Hey, welcome to the March 2022 edition. Hope your day's going well. Um, our 2022, uh, March 2022 Lunch and Learn. Today, uh, we're going to kind of mix things up a bit, and we're, we're going to have a webinar that was recorded, oh, a number of months ago by a couple of folks in our project management um, profession, Linda Carter and Dave Davis. Um, to, so in this webinar today, we're going to hear from them in regards to integrating agile techniques in traditional projects. Um, just something as well that we're looking forward to is uh, bringing them live to a future Lunch and Learn, probably um, later in this year. Um, but um, we can build on the subject that they're going to talk about today and then hear from them um, live in person um, at a session later this year. Um, for this webinar, there's a, there are um, some points within the webinar where the speakers will ask questions. Those questions, and we'd love to hear from this audience, have been loaded in the polls. So on your right-hand menu of your hop in, you will see a session, you'll see an event and then a session area. Click on the session at the top of that menu, and then within there are some polls. When prompted during this webinar, um, we'll take a we'll take a break and um, give everyone a chance to respond to the polls. During during the seminar or during this webinar, if you have questions or run into issues, um, there's also a chat um, window available under session, and then any Q and A that you if there's anything that you um, might want to ask or respond to, um, use the Q and A for your comments there. So welcome everybody. Looks like we've got um, just over 40 people on board. Um, we did have a good registration, so expecting um, some others to come in during the next few minutes. But with that, Cheryl, um, let's go ahead and get started with the Integrating Agile Techniques into Traditional Projects webinar. All right, here we go. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the webinar, Integrating Agile Techniques into into traditional projects presented by Linda Carter and Dave Davis. Linda Carter is the founder and president of Competitive Edge Consulting, Inc. She has extensive ex project management experience, which includes designing and delivering project management training programs, as well as senior project management leaders in various industries in all aspects of project management. Linda is a lecturer in both the math and computer science departments and the MBA program at Baldwin Wallace University. Dave Davis is currently a senior program manager for Ohio Air, implementing an EPMO and managing merger and acquisition projects. Prior to that, he worked for General Electric, focused on implementing the digital thread, combining IT and manufacturing within a program called Brilliant Factor. Dave's also chairman of the Judy Hug annual Christmas event. So without any further delay, please help me welcome Linda and Dave. Thank you for the introduction. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. You can see that Dave and I have um, a lot of combined experience in project management, wide range of range of roles and industry. So we're going to get started here with this, on the webinar with a little bit of a purpose and remind us why we're here today. We're going to provide you with a quick overview of some agile concepts, just to level set us, um, and some um, techniques from an agile methodology perspective. Uh, focusing on an organization's readiness for agile concepts. So, you know, where are, where's your organization? Where's the culture? Where are your teams? Where are you? Um, and then we're going to jump into some specific techniques that will, that can be applied to projects that are uh, ready for agile or even some projects that are more traditional in nature, um, where the culture may not support um, a movement to agile. So somewhere in that hybrid zone there. Um, we're going to wrap up with an implementation strategy for integrating Agile into what you do. So with that in mind, um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to start with the Agile overview. And I'm going to turn the conversation over to Dave. He's going to walk us through um, a, a couple introduction slides here. Yeah, first of all, I think we all know that 2001, the Agile Manifesto was developed. And that sort of became the pivot. Agile becoming uh, different things. 
there were a lot of stuff that had happened before 2001 that was able to drive some of the ideas and the values of the Agile Manifesto. And these principles are going to apply whether you're doing an adjunct project or a predictive project, an iterative, whatever. It doesn't matter. The principles make sense in a lot of ways, and it just happens right now within the agile space. The four principles, most of you have probably already read these or are aware of them, I'll go over real quick. We're going to talk about things you can do today that apply some of this stuff. Individuals and interactions over process and tools that's been out time. Talk futures, working for the people. And that's basically what it's for the people listening. Interaction is probably the more important word there. Not just being with an individual, but doing things like actively listening, probing, doing different uh, humble inquiries, uh, common methodology approach today. The next working software over comprehensive documentation. We've had several different terms for that over the years, working prototypes, different things. But seeing something, being able to touch, feel, and be able to give a little bit of a concrete example of abstract processes, that's going to be much better than documentation, which for the most part is still an abstract level. So like that I a working thing, because we remember that especially in the PMI, ACP world, Agile is not just for software. Agile is a mindset sort of process, project, program improvement being initiated by an organization. Uh, if you remember, yep. PMI basic concept is change is made through the implementation of programs and projects. Then so if I can jump in real quick, Dave, I, I just wanted to thank you for saying that Agile is just not for software. So we look at the software, working software bullet, it's really anything that's a, a working product or service. Right, component pieces, so it doesn't have to be software, so. Yep. A couple of collaboration over contract negotiation. Again, talking with the people, not necessarily what you can't do, we can't undo, but what do we need to do? And then finally, and been doing this for 30 plus years, but responding to change over following a plan. Agile embraces change anywhere within the project. Now, it doesn't say the change is automatically going to be implemented or anything like that. It embraces it and has a structured way to be able to deal with change. We had change control in the PMI by PMI guide and stuff uh, for at least 20 years, probably from the original one. But the idea is responding to change and being able to have some ground rules for how you deal with change. And again, this is not just a software piece, but it's overall change within being able to deliver those outcomes and capabilities for your customer, which is a result of the project. Before we jump to the next slide, can I, I just want to add a, a, a comment in here, David, and that is that um, when I teach project management in the undergraduate level at the university, and we talk about the Agile Manifesto, the students always look at me a little perplexed and say, how is this any different than how we've been talking about things all along? because they haven't been institutionalized in a methodology. They've learned about risk. They've learned about communications. They've learned about stakeholder management, all the components. Never in their mind did they think they're going to be collaborating with the customer or unflexible to change or, or um, taking uh, process and tools as being more important than individuals and interactions. And I think that just reinforces the whole concept that this is truly a mindset that we want to take an approach to integrating these techniques into whatever kinds of project scenarios we're using. Okay. Agile is a blanket. And that's one of the things that I, I'm wrestling with when talk with people. You know, what is Agile? What is Crystal Method? You know, there's different methodologies, and that's what these things fit in the blue circles down below. Agile, an overall umbrella, and I've been noticing some chat that it's a mindset, and Linda had mentioned it. it's a mindset. That agile is a way of thinking. And then there's just lots of different defined rule bases and structure that fit with under that umbrella. But if we pull this back to an agile way of thinking, which is to be able to deliver incremental pieces of working product to get feedback, to be able to grow, rapidly respond to change, and do things very quickly and very iteratively. And that's basically what it is. There's a lot of different models out there. And this picture, the way I think, is directly from the Agile Companion to 
Pimbac guy, which came out with Pimbac 6.0 last year. I think it was September last year, the release. So we're embracing Agile, again, more the mindset than specific um, approach or methodology. Next. All right. Um, so with that in mind, when we think about uh, project selection and do we want to use Agile, do we want to use um, hybrid, do we want to use uh, more traditional project management, really when you think about the tools as opposed to the methodology, what we want to think about is how clear are requirements. So if we look at this graphic here, it's got requirements on one side from uh, close to agreement. We know exactly what we're trying to deliver. We know what our requirements are. Um, they're clearly defined, clearly understood. Or to the other extreme where we've got uh, maybe indecision in terms of what our requirements are or conflicting requirements or unclear requirements. We know what the first thing is, but we're not sure what's going to come after that. So we have kind of one side of the graph looking at requirements. We have the other side of the graph looking at technology. Um, and I would say that, again, not the word technology, but it's really um, the work necessary to achieve the requirements. Is it certain work, right? So simple or certain work, meaning we've done this before, we understand this, we can do this, right? Or is it far from certainty, meaning we're not sure what it's going to take in order to deliver these requirements. There's a lot of unknown in terms of the steps or the process um, and the knowledge that it takes. And so we have this continuum from simple projects to complicated projects to complex to uh, chaos, right, in terms of uh, how, what the feel of that project is from simple to chaos. And if we think about methodology, we bring that back into play, uh, the simple is uh, simple repeatable processes almost to the point where it's operationalized and project management um, becomes a standard repeatable process too, where we've got a lot of seat of our pants or chaos pieces, where we need a lot of flexibility in the module uh, that we are, um, are using here. David, you want to add anything here? Um, no, except this continuum you'll see being used quite a bit in the new standard. And more likely than not, the upper right is better designed for agile approaches as opposed to the lower left. The lower left is something almost line of repeatable projects. We we know what it is. We have a pretty good idea of what the outcomes and steps that need to come. There's not as much complexity. They may be standard uh, work, workflows, et cetera, where groups have operations type responsibilities. That's kind of where it fits in. Okay, great. And so, the, you know, to tie it back to um, what we hear from mind in terms of the methodology piece, these middle ones are projects that are will benefit from a more hybrid approach. Right? So we're curious, we have a question here for you, so if you can open up the poll. Okay, Brian, so I think we're ready to open up our own polls. Yes, yes. So um, of the 48 people that are viewing this now, um, take a look at the polls under the session um, portion of your menu. The first poll question, if everyone can just um, answer the question, where do most of the projects you are responsible for reside on the uncertainty and complexity model? Simple, complicated, complex, or chaos? And then make a choice on that poll and then we'll see what the response is from the attendees today. I think we have about 20 votes in. Thirty votes in. So yeah, Cheryl. So uh, interesting. The um, the vast majority are in that yellow orange section. Um, mm -hmm. More more complicated. A few more complicated than complex. Um, right. One for chaos. And then uh, five in the simple category. So right. Um, so yeah. it seems like, um, according to what Linda and Dave have been sharing with us, then most of these projects would tend to fall in that category somewhere between uh, more of a traditional predictive approach uh, and then moving more toward agile because your requirements might be changing. Maybe they're not fully fleshed out. Maybe you know there yeah. are some, um, unknowns there. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Looks um, good. 
do you want to have me skip ahead or do we want to hear what the results were for their prior meeting? Um, let's go ahead and hear what they had to say. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I wonder where most of the projects that you're responsible for reside on the certainty and uncertainty complex. Are you managing more simple projects, more complicated projects, more complex projects, or are you managing chaos? If you could get your votes in, that would be great. And I do realize that, you know, we, we all run different types of projects. So uh, we're looking here for just kind of what, what's the majority of your projects, where they were done. Yes. And, and to add to this, complexity can be both technical complexity and organizational complexity. That's so again, we might, Agile isn't just a software development approach. You can have well-defined software development processes, et cetera, but a user community that is having issues with funding, I see this a lot in merger and acquisition world. Um, complexity as far as the whole organizational change management, not necessarily in delivering a technical product. All right, so hopefully everyone's gotten their votes in. The poll is closing now. Results will be ready in about eight seconds. Great. I changed the slide. I'll still be able to see the results from the poll. You should see them now. I don't see them. I don't see them. So would you, would, can you read them to us? Oh, there they are. All right. But um, by the way, for, for the polls are under the polling in the right hand side. There's the polling drop down. So if you click that, you'll see the re uh, results. And when we do open the next poll, the poll itself will be on the right hand side. I saw one or two people ask where was the poll. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, and so if, maybe not everyone can see the results if you can't see the results. There's a very small percentage of people that are in the simple and the chaos area. A majority of people are having complex projects, right? So they're leaning a little towards the chaos. Um, and then the second highest percentage is the complicated projects, which are no longer simple um, and moving away in terms of either requirements or technical clarity there. Um, and I don't think that's very surprising, right? Uh, as we as we grow in our development and project management, our application, we get we we do get a lot more complex projects. We have cross-functional projects. Uh, we have a lot of different people that have different ideas about what requirements should be. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns there. Okay. All right. So when we ask, you know, so why are we asking this question? What is this level set about? Um, when we think about approaches. Right, we have a predictive approach, which is for fixed requirements. Those are for our simple projects. That gives us a si single delivery, and the triangle piece that's really fixed a lot of times there is managing the cost, right, in relationship to the time and to the scope of the project. When we get into iterative and incremental, we're looking at more of the complex and the uh, complicated projects. This is a more dynamic requirement approach. An iterative project is working towards single delivery, right? They're repeating work until they get it right with an ultimate single delivery where incremental is uh, smaller, more frequent deliverables. And then we get to the chaos, which is really built for agile projects where, um, you know, we're reprioritizing our work and delivering smaller, uh, more frequently bundles of, of, of products. So when we look at these characteristics and we map them against this table, Right, we can see this continuum over here where you've got agile being for more of the chaos projects and more predictive projects, uh, more simple projects, looking for um, more traditional project management pieces. Yeah, and speak to this, this also increment or continuum is in the agile guide for the Pinbot Companion. And important thing to know, especially starting for the ACP, notice the word waterfall isn't on here. You're going to start seeing more and more predictive. And by that, it basically means that we have a better understanding. We have a big upfront plan. So we're able to predict the different milestones and how they fit in. And you know, this, this, that's where this continuum is. Again, the high degree of change, high frequency of delivery, more adapt to agile methodologies and agile tools. Uh, the predictive tools are more along the lines of well-defined risk mitigation plans that you have the risk 
plan that's out there and you review risk once a month or whatever and you look at that. Add in a little bit more. We deal with risk frequently in an iterative basis and where does it fit in with our stories. Uh, we do retrospectives, et cetera, looking at risk. I think, the, I think the key takeaway here is that there are different types of projects and there are different methodologies that are targeted at the different types of projects. And wherever you are on the continuum, you want to look to your toolkit and say, what are the tools that are going to help me be successful and drive success with this project? And if you have a more predictive project, you're going to use more traditional tools. And if you have a more agile project, you're probably going to use more of those agile tools, right? All right, let me move to the next slide here. You can summarize your okay. agile methods. Yeah, I'm not going to read this to you, but you know some of the basic principles, we had them before in the Agile Manifesto chart, but same thing here, value-driven. In the seven domains within the uh, PMI uh, ACP guide, one of, you know, the second one is value-driven delivery. Uh, we focus on value. Value, again, being more than just dollars. Value has a lot of things with customer capacity, capability, yada, yada, yada. But the idea is focus align project, project team vision to deliver better quality. Uh, faster and cheaper. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure I like the word cheaper, but a better value. <laughs> um, small batches, it's chunking. This concept of chunking has been around for a long time, too. I mean, we've had interactive prototypes, prototypes of just one piece, small focus groups, whatever terms you want to look at, uh, whether it's a software project or other types of projects, we've had an approach of doing things in small batches and being able to roll them up into the whole. Small integrated teams, um, the collaboration, face-to-face -face communication, co-location, those soft skills, I think osmotic, osmotic communication is the term that is used for co-locating people close by so they can overhear a conversation, get an idea from it, or cross each other on the way to the cafeteria and say, hey, what are you working on? Get ideas, cross-pollination, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a, it's the human element. Try and encourage as much human element as we can as human communication. And then the small continuous improvements, reflecting, et cetera. One of the principles, again, in that other we could incorporate today in our traditional project is the retrospective and the ideas. What are some things we can do that might make ourselves, as a team, more productive to reduce waste, uh, those agile principles? And what are some things that we can do that, that can encourage you? One of the things that you may be able to implement fairly quickly is that when we do a uh, status call or we have some sort of stand-up meeting, enforce the seven-second rule. I don't know if you're familiar with the seven-second rule is, but it's basically a governance point that if we can't solve this problem in seven seconds, we're going to defer it to its own meeting. So that's a technique, an agile principle that we could put in today because we all struggle with making sure our meetings are productive and useful to everybody and balancing that with people that want to go down into details to solve the problem where we've got everybody together. So if we say, hey, seven-second rule, anybody can call seven-second rule, we scribe down and we're going to have an after meeting that addresses that. So that's what Linda and I are trying to talk about here is a lot of these principles we can implement today. And that's a good example of the small continuous improvement. I don't think anybody's being halted from doing small incremental improvements in your project team, even if it's a large predictive project. water type project. Okay. Method selection. And actually, the concept of hybrid tailoring is, again, pre very prevalent in the PMI Agile Companion. And that's why I would argue that almost all approaches today are within that hybrid role. And tailoring is basically a way of, we understand that the process knowledge areas, the workflows, et cetera, are frameworks and models. It's not one size fit all. Tailoring means we take the stuff out of those different tools and techniques and frameworks and knowledge areas, and et cetera, and modify them to fit our need, or adjust them to fit our need. And so hybrid is just a combination of these predictive, iterative approaches, tools, and techniques. If any of you are familiar with PMBOK guide, ITTOs, inputs, tools, techniques, and outputs. Hybrid says that you're able to combine some different things in this ITTO. There's some tools here that, you know what, the PMBOK guide says this, but there's an agile type tool that I can use here I'm comfortable with, and it's 
perfectly okay to implement that into how you manage and run your project. And then the monitor and control. So let's uh, see that this spans these agile techniques can span everywhere. And um, the combining various approaches with this one. And these are just some examples. I mean, we can do Kanban or Kanban type approaches within predictive. I saw a question here or a comment here earlier about somebody saying that they were an infrastructure project and that it's hard to do agile. And that's that's a true statement, but there's some where with Kanban fits very well. You're doing some sort of you know, hardware enhancement, Windows 10 upgrade, Windows upgrade, for example. You know, Kanban, the, these PCs, this group of PCs bunched this way is in this this stage. It's on the plan that people have been notified is happening. We have technicians lined up to do the chain. It's scheduled to here, whatever. And you can have multiple groups that each one gets pulled out of the ice box and put into a different spot to flow through. And that's where hybrid comes in. So we're combining concepts within Kemet, which actually isn't even a project management. Its roots are in manufacturing and to be able to uh, increase the efficiency on the production line. So we can pick and choose and build these things at tailoring. We, we build with the tools we have, and it's kind of like a bunch of Lego blocks out there, and I can build whatever I want with the Lego pieces. And that's also where we get into like fit the purpose. One of the other things that agile methodologies promote is the concept of barely sufficient and minimal viable product. And we can start to look at those, and you know, I've been involved in years of software where we had minimum data sets and those different pieces. But the idea of minimum is what is the most critical that has to be delivered. And then some other things are building upon that. So you have that foundation, we get the foundation working, then how can we add some more uh, complex or more integrated features? And then your roles are gonna change. One of the things that I talk to a lot of people about as they implement Agile, they're really implementing Scrum, is where does the project manager fit in here and where does the BA fit in here? And my answer does come back to tailoring. The methodology, the Scrum methodology has three roles. as a Scrum master, the product owner, and team members. We can still have somebody specializing in me as a BA. I'm working with the product owner on developing good stories. I'm making sure, quote, requirements, unquote, are presented in the user story manner. That is just an idea of tailoring. And as we've talked about before, with traditional projects, you may not be embracing uh, agile within your project itself, but you can still have the requirements based in story forms and do the concept of epics and user stories and break those down into features and break those down into tasks, et cetera, et cetera. It's available to you today. So the selection here, it kind of looks at what are the project needs. And then here we have some things around the outside, which are characteristics of different parts of agile methodologies. And those are perfectly acceptable uh, within any type of project you do, whether it's an iterative or predictive or whatever. Yeah, thanks for that, Dave. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you might wonder, when are we going to jump into the techniques that we can use? Dave, that have been mentioning a lot of them as we go through it. But when we think about Agile as being a mindset, we want to think about not just the techniques, but what is the mindset? And how do we, how do we get the readiness there um, for our team, our organization, um, and our project. So we're going to talk about uh, readiness. And again, as we go through this material, if you say, I'm not ready at all, it doesn't mean that there aren't some techniques which we'll talk through um, that'll be helpful. Uh, but it, it tells you that there are other organizational factors that need to be addressed. And hopefully this is, I see there's like great solutions uh, or questions being popped up here. And hopefully we can address some of them as we go through these next few slides of, of readiness. So we're following a model here in terms of uh, suitability, suitability for agile techniques. Um, and it focuses on three components. Is your culture ready? Is your team ready? Um, and is the project level ready? So we're looking at it from these three different um, levels of readiness. So we're going to just jump into the first one here. And this is cultural readiness. Um, what we really want to know is if there's commitment. If we want to move completely to agile, we need um, senior level commitment, we need user involvement, not, and this is different than maybe traditional user involvement. We're not asking users to be part of the requirements and part of the testing, but we're asking them to be part of the team, to be engaged in the process, to be available in a real-time methodology where they can 
um, answer questions, where they can look at samples, where they can, where you can have a, a fluid, real-time conversation with them, and that we need senior leadership from a cultural perspective that they understand the, the value of the user involvement, that they're encouraging that, and that they're freeing up those resources to really be part of the team of the project. Um, we look at um, the environment for support. We're looking for buy-in. We're looking for trust within the team. We're going to talk about team pieces, but we're going to, you know, from a culture perspective, is there trust within the organization? Is there a, a, an environment where we can have honest conversations, where we can share ideas, where we can try things and fail, learn from them, try them again, so that we can deliver success? Right? So that requires some decision-making authority at the team level. If you have an organization that has a lot of hierarchy, it may be harder to use some of these techniques because the techniques are all built around open communication, trust, and collaboration. And if you don't have the cultural readiness for those pieces, then some of the techniques may be more challenging. And you might want to create first a plan for cultural readiness. Now, you may have cultural readiness at your team level, which is great, then you can apply these techniques. Um, you may have it at your department level or your organizational level, which is even better, right? But if we can have really good cultural in chaos, it's better if we have good cultural readiness at the organization level, if that's something um, that we can leverage. And the last bullet here is really important. Can the organization accommodate frequent delivery of increments? So if I'm going to deliver things along the way, are my customers willing and able to do that? Or do they have to wait till a major change comes and adopt a major change at one point in time? Again, this is a mindset. So maybe traditionally we are used to waiting until we have everything we need and we can have that um, changeover happen where the old things get turned off, new things, new processes, procedures are made available. But maybe we can work with our, and this is where user involvement becomes so important. How do we design a solution where we have incremental wins along the way, where we can absorb small changes along the way so that when the project is completed, instead of having it be a huge change in terms of our approach or use of the new technology or the product or service, it's something that we have slowly eased into along the way. So we need some readiness from an organizational perspective the willingness for collaboration to be able to get there. Okay. So and the next one, I think we have a question yeah. coming up here, right? Yes, there's a question. I was trying to find the slide. Sorry, I lost sort of where I was here. So I would what I'd like is another polling question here. Do you think there's cultural readiness? And you can pick um, any that apply here. Maybe it's in your work group. So your your direct under your direct leadership or from your boss, you have um, good cultural readiness, right? Uh, good trust, good decision-making authority, um, willingness to really bring in the customers and be part of the process. Or maybe it happens at the department level or maybe within the organization. So if you could find your poll and... Yeah. Okay, good. So we're ready to kick off ours, I think. Yes. So. Um... Team, take a look at poll number two, and let's see where we're at as far as cultural readiness. Um, it only lets you pick one on the poll, so I guess pick the one that's most relevant for you as far as where your organization is at for readiness. Okay, Cheryl, it looks like that um, for this audience in your department for operational leadership, uh, mm -hmm. cultural readiness has the majority of votes and then pretty evenly split right. at the executive level and at this or at the supervisor, immediate supervisor level. It's kind of an interesting distribution, isn't it? I, I think I would have thought of it more as a grassroots team would have been maybe more ready for something like that and then moving up through the organization, but uh, this is interesting. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So, oh, go ahead. As I say, let's continue on. And I noticed on the last poll, there was quite a bit of dead air on their end. So if 
if you feel like you need to move ahead. Okay, uh, I will. Or, will just do. in the interest of time. Sure. Okay. Answer um, the question. Yep. That'd be great. And the polls on the bottom right, and if it. Oh, but a, a lot. The... This is the previous slide here. Okay. Also in, Linda. We're looking at, oh, look at that. All right. So um, not surprised. I suppose maybe we should predict these responses before we, we, we turn over the results. But a, a, the largest percentage feel that there's cultural readiness in their direct work group, right? This is the area we have direct control over. Um, and then in our department and um, a, a percentage of you in your organization is, as well. So again, when we think about agile mindset, this is the mindset we need from a cultural perspective. We also need team readiness. When we think about team readiness, this is one of the questions I saw um, pop up on the side. What's the right size in terms of team? Um, so that's a that's a an interesting question because people will say, well, agile teams have to be um, you know seven people or smaller. And I've seen successful agile projects that had a hundred people on them. But in reality, that 100 people were all broken out down into smaller project teams where they had um, a smaller group that was working together. And I think that's the trick. When you think about what's the suitable size for an agile team, it's a team that allows for collaboration. If you have too many people, not everybody's going to have an equal voice. So people will not feel like they're comfortable in terms of speaking of a larger group. So when we think about size, it is, it's the ability to build relationships, the ability to communicate effectively, the ability to have face time, whether it's sitting next to each other or through technology to get that um, face time. We need to be able to build relationships because it's people over process, right? So we need we need um, a smaller group from that perspective. Um, shared leadership. So we, um, I don't know if anyone was listening before the webinar started, but Dave was talking about the um, Oh, Dave, the term just slipped right out of my mind. Well, I don't remember what I was talking about. <laughs> well, we'll get we'll get to it later. Um, and if there's servant leadership. Servant leadership. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, servant leadership, right? We're we're really changing the way we look at leadership here. If we're going to have true collaboration, then people are not looking for one person to make decisions to have the authority, but they're looking for collaboration and, and sharing of ideas. Right, that as a project manager, or if you're doing again a methodology like Scrum as a Scrum leader, you know when to step aside and allow people to step up and and lead. So when we think about stages of team dynamics. If you've got a team that is in the um, forming stage, the storming stage, the norming stage, a traditional manager style can be effective there. But if you really want a team to perform, then coaching and mentoring really has to be more of the style. Of leadership, so there again, you know, we're we're dancing around this um, concept of trust here. We can trust other people to step up and share skills. We can um, step up if we have the skills that need to be shared, right? So we're looking at shared leadership. We're looking at uh, experience. We need experienced resources. Does that mean that we can't have new people on the team? Um, no, it doesn't mean that. But we want to make sure that they have the coaching, the mentoring, and the time available. So that they can get to performing and focusing on the, on the work that needs to be done here, right? So um, we've got team sizes that allow for responsibility. We've got shared collaborative leadership styles. We have uh, performing team members bringing the skills to play. We've got clients that are on our team and that team members can have access to. We don't have to have a single point of contact, right? And a hierarchy of command for communication. Um, the next bullet talks about the team remaining the same throughout the project. This is really just good human uh, relation piece, right? If we if we have a lot of churn in our project team, we lose the continuity. We don't have the history of where we were going, how we work together, and how to move things forward. So continuity um, is really important on and, and, and thinking from an agile perspective. How do I get the same team? How do I get the continuity of the team members? Um, throughout the life of the project, um, as well as the balance of work, right? So when we plan our, our schedules here, we're looking at schedules that have consistent team members as well as uh, time available to work on the project. 
And then face-to-face -face communication. We know that it's the best way to communicate. Are there other ways? Absolutely. There are lots of other ways, but the most effective communication um, continues to be face-to-face. -face. And some technologies are better at simulating that than others. Right? So again, when we think about the techniques, we want to think about, is our team ready? So let's look at your uh, quick responses to your team readiness. There's another polling question here, and I guess what I'd like to know is, you know, think about your project, your team. Are you ready? Maybe it's yes, we are with a lot of enthusiasm. Maybe you're kind of on the fence there, and you're thinking, um, we could be, but we need a lot of coaching. The project manager is going to have to do a lot of coaching to build the trust, um, to get the commitment, to get the shared leadership piece. Um, or maybe you're even more on the fence, and you're like, um, maybe, but there's left to do. Uh, maybe your team's not there yet, and maybe you think, oh, in my organization, my team will never be at this level of readiness. So take a moment, get your votes in. Yeah, so we'll take a look at poll number three now, folks. Vote for your team readiness. Looks like we've got some overwhelming yes with some coaching and guidance. Encouraging to see that uh, so far, no, probably not ever. <laughs> so that's encouraging. It's That's kind of the way that it is in today's world, largely. All right, Cheryl. So about two thirds of the yes with some coaching and guidance. Yes, we're ready about 15%. No, not yet. And then one vote for no, probably not ever. <laughs> Well, at least, you know, there's honesty there. That's, yep. that's important, yep. you know. Absolutely. Can't move forward unless you know what's what's not working, so. Um, okay, so shall we go ahead and start again? Yes, please. All right. Dave, you wanna make a prediction? Where do you think people are? I think we're gonna see a lot of yes with some coaching. Okay, that's a very good place to be, right? Because it is a, it's a new way of thinking about the team and the team's ability to collaborate and work together and really be a performing team, um, and that takes a lot of time, effort, coaching. So let's see what the poll says. We will have results in about 10 seconds. All right, great, thank you. Now that's an iterative time box approach. <laughs> All right, and uh, looks like you were you were good, Dave. All right, we got a yes with some coaching and some maybe, uh, but there's work to do. So, kind of similar in answer there. Um, fortunately, very few people said not ever. Um, about 73 of you said not now, um, and an equal number of them said yes, we are. So, kind of uh, a little bell curve here with uh, very little on the extremes, and most of you guys kind of on the fence, being ready to be pushed into. Uh, readiness for some of these collaborative techniques. So one more piece to look at, and that is the project. So I've got my cultural readiness, I've got my team readiness, and I've got project readiness. Maybe my team is ready, but I don't have clear ownership in my project. Or um, I have a list of requirements, but my requirements can't be prioritized. I don't know what the most important thing is, so I can't figure out what to pick off first in terms of delivery. Right. Um, everything's the first. Everyone's every priority is number one. Equal priority. Right. That, that makes it very difficult to do incremental delivery along the way. Um, project readiness. If um, requirements are fluid, you can have stable requirements that don't have to be fluid. Right. As long as you can prioritize them and you're going to revisit this and prioritize them, that's okay. Uh, but if I have fluid requirements, that makes it easier to do incremental delivery and reprioritize re my requirements as they become available, right? This is a, a good example of this is if you're doing a project that has some discovery or some R&D components of it, right, where you've got a project where we're going to try something out, we're going to see what the results are, we're going to learn from that, and that's going to tell us where our next steps are, right? Then we can start to look at the requirements being more fluid, um, but we can reprioritize things as we move through the life of the project, right? Um, high risk of change. If there's a lot of volatility in terms of change, then this can be a good project for um, applying more of these agile techniques to them. 
right? Because, because we are reprioritizing our requirements when the business needs change. And by the way, change is not a bad thing. I think change and change management has gotten kind of a bad name in project management. But if we're being responsive to the business, the business needs have changed, competitive pieces have changed, technologies changed, right? And we're being responsive to the business and adapting to that change. It's a really powerful way to be as a project team and a project manager in terms of the delivery of our solutions. We want to be able to be responsive to that. So again, higher rates of change make a project more ready for some of these techniques. Uh, we talked about developing a solution in increments. Not all projects fit that, right? So if you have a project where classic example I like to use for explaining agile versus traditional is if I'm building a, a dog house for my dog and the first thing I want to do is get the priority of getting my dog out of the rain, then I'm going to build a four post uh, roof right, that protects them from the rain, and that's my first delivery. And the next time around, I want to protect them from uh, the wind. So now I'm going to put sides on my dog, so now my dog is protected from the wind, and now my dog's a muddy mess from the rain and the wind, and so I want to protect them from the mud, and I'm going to put a floor in my dog house. So that's a solution that can be developed in increments. But we can take that same kind of building piece and say, I, it won't work for a house because I need to have a roof and walls and the ceiling before I get an occupancy permit. And therefore, that completion of a house doesn't work as well in um, an, an incremental delivery. Now, you can um, in terms of other parts of completion of a house, but really um, some projects lean more to incremental delivery. Some projects um, have a harder challenge trying to find that incremental delivery. Um, and then the last bullet, right, Pr prototype sampling. Um, practicing demos, drawings, models, anything that we can create to see solutions earlier than waiting till the final delivery uh, will help a project be more ready for using some of these techniques. So, do you have a project in mind um, that's ready to try a hybrid approach? Got another. All right, team. Um, time for poll number four. Do you have a project that it's ready to try a hybrid approach? Yes, no, not sure yet. Looks like we've got a um, vast majority of yes, about two thirds. And in my experience, Cheryl, it's been um, in, uh, in my organization, it very much is a hybrid approach on how projects are managed today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in in my experience, I, we uh, I used to refer to it as adaptive, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Basically, whatever tools you had in the toolbox at the client side is what we would uh, apply, and uh, we would try to morph the methodology as needed. Um, so yes, absolutely, I think a hybrid approach. I'm not sure there's anything that's absolutely pure traditional or pure agile, there's always going to be a mix of iterative and traditional and so forth. Um, yep. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. It looks like the close to two thirds are yes. And then a right. few no's and some not yet. Mm -hmm. So thank you everybody. All right. So um, I'm just going to jump in here and say we've got 11 minutes left and we are going to be right up next to the end time on here because I wasn't able to edit the video down. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to kind of cut it at the very end where they open it up for um, general um, questions. So stick with us, everybody. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Cheryl. Cool question here. I hope everyone has a um, some little bit on body of knowledge areas. How quickly will we see our responses here? I've uh, got about 15 seconds. Okay. But, um, a, a large majority of you that have a project that you're ready to try some of these techniques for, that's very exciting, right? Um, so as we get into these technique map here, what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, just three of the body of knowledge areas. We could do it for all of them, but Actually, Dave and I talked about it. We said we only have an hour. We can't do it for all of them. So let's focus on um, a smaller slice of it. When we think about scoping, right, from a traditional, we're thinking about project boundaries. And from agile techniques, we're looking at um, other techniques we can add here. Now, you might look at the first agile technique and say a vision statement. Vision statements 
you know, actually go beyond the use of project management. They're using organizational strategies, so not just an agile technique. Can we use them in traditional projects? Absolutely. Um, but in my experience, the vision statements in traditional projects, whereas in agile, we are more willing to bring those pieces in, right? Definition of done, right? What does success look like? Creating user stories for um, some of our requirements, doing prototyping, um, backlogging for looking at um, work that's remaining, um, visual planning boards. We're going to look at some of these techniques here. When we think about traditional project management in terms of uh, timing, we're looking at sequencing of deliverables, network diagrams, charts, group point estimating. Can we use those in a hybrid? Absolutely, but we can also use sprints and iteration time boxes for scheduling and planning poker and the bucket system and t-shirt sizes and affinity mapping. Lots of other techniques for estimating um, and for tracking. Dave's going to talk about burn down charts um, and some Kanban boards. Um, some we, we don't have the time to look at all of these, but we're going to highlight some of them here, um, as well as retrospectives from a stakeholder management perspective. Yeah, and Linda, the one thing, yeah, the, you slipped it in there, but as a key word for planning board, you mentioned visual. One of the things with the agile techniques is very strong on visual being able to present graphically a lot of different pieces of information. Great. Well, let's jump in and look at some of these techniques. And the first thing we're going to do, thank you for the transition there, is a visual planning board, right? Uh, visuals are really, are really powerful. And again, it doesn't have to be an agile project. I do planning workshops. Um, which are visual planning boards that are created by project teams. And they can be as small as two or three people. And I've done them for planning sessions of over 50 people where we're in a room and we're creating these visuals here. So in this illustration, we've got obstacles or challenges that need to be overcome or business needs that need to be satisfied. Um, and that creates our to-do list uh, where we write out our requirements, we develop things, we test things. Um, we demo things and we have our indications. So a visual planning board, right? Now, um, it's possible if you work in an organization that has stringent PMO requirements that you need certain paper documents, then you might create a visual planning board as a summary with your team collaboratively and take that information, harvest it from the planning board to create those more tactical um, PMO documentation. Or you might find you've got some flexibility in your PMO. I work with customers before that we can take photographs of our planning boards as they evolve over time and we can store the documents so that we've got good history there. Right? So again, it's a, it's a simple technique um, that brings a lot of power. It's way more powerful to have these visual planning boards than it is to have a lot of the, the technical documentation because I don't know if you're like me at all, but you start reading pages and pages of documents, you lose the intent, your eyes kind of glaze over. Um, it can be hard to really stay focused and get kind of the heat of what's trying to be um, communicated there. So a visual planning board can be very powerful for that. We can also do daily stand-ups. So Dave has mentioned daily stand-ups. Um, he's mentioned the seven-second rule. Um, you know, if we can't resolve something in seven seconds or less, then it needs to be communicated um, and resolved outside of the meeting. Um, and I think that's the most important thing. I see people take these techniques in a hybrid way uh, and use them in a way that was very ineffective. Daily stand-ups have turned into hour-long discussions that feel more like traditional stats reporting. Um, that's not effective. So if you want to use one of these techniques, do a little reading about them and find out what's the purpose of a daily stand-up. The purpose of a stand-up is to make sure everybody understands what's going on in the project um, in a quick way. So you're just sharing. This is what I did yesterday. This is what I'm going to do today. This is what's in my way. Next person, they're going to do the same thing. So if in five minutes or less, depending upon the number of people, you can get a real quick understanding of what's going on. And if somebody has something in their way that they, you can help with, because remember, we're focused on collaboration here, then after that stand-up, you can invest some more time and resolve that issue. right? But it doesn't take the whole team to be in that conversation. And daily stand-ups can be any time, right? If you have teams that don't have the privilege of working together physically and are in different time zones, right? Maybe you move the daily stand-up to different time zones throughout the day. So um, it might be the beginning of someone's day. It might be the end of somebody else's day on your team. We 
can do retrospectives. Um, retrospectives, really, this is part of the closing stage of a tr traditional project. And like most organizations, when you get to the closing stage, everyone is so happy to be done with the project that they um, don't get as much value from the closing stage as they should, or they don't remember all the learning that happened throughout the life of the project. So this is taking key points in the life of the project, maybe at major milestones or at a certain time cadence and saying, so what's going well that we um, sh should start doing um, or do more of? What's not going well we need to stop doing? And what have we learned? It's really building that learning into the organization. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, there's one other thing. Dedicate a retrospective meeting to a retrospective meeting. I've seen some people try to sneak it in. Oh, the last 15 minutes of this meeting, we're going to do a retrospective and you know, playing this game. If you're going to do retrospective, you got to be serious about doing retrospective. you got to communicate that everybody knows what it does, the brainstorming, participation, after, all those other things with it, and then we are spending time looking back at what are we doing well, where can we approve, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're going to do now a retrospective meeting, do retrospective meetings. That's the agenda, and that's what we're going to do here. Not, oh, we'll just throw a few minutes on the end and play retrospective games. That, that won't work. So I guess to come back to a lot of this, the thing Linda's talking about on this is you've got to approach it seriously and focus on that piece. Not just kind of throw it in as, oh, why don't we try this for a few minutes and is it fun? But you really need to dedicate time and resource, especially and if you're going to be doing retrospectives. One of the questions somebody just asked about how long should a retrospective take um, really depends on where you are in the life of the project and whether your team is schooled in doing retrospectives. It should be brief. Um, it could be an open discussion. I've done them like a visual planning board where I just have people brainstorm on sticky. These here are the things we should stop. Here are the things we should start. This is what we've learned, and we put them up on the wall, um, and it becomes a brief conversation. So there's ways to um, to do it fluidly um, and and focused as well. But I like Dave's comment about you know do it do it intensely. Good get word. Up Thank you. <laughs> we have a bunch more slides to go through. I, I just want to share an estimating technique. One of the things that can be a challenge in larger projects is that we are guessing how long things take. We're, we're coming up with estimates. We can use the three-point estimate. We can um, we can we can look at history, but we are really just guessing. So one of the things that we can do is I love this T-shirt size sizing. Right? Uh, what sizes? What sizes does this work? Is it extra small, small, medium, large, or extra large? And when you use t-shirt sizing, one of the things you do as a team is you decide what extra small means for this particular project. So you might say extra small is something that can be done between zero and four hours, and small is something before, between um, four and eight hours, and medium is something between eight and 16 hours. You can you decide what the range is, right? A large might be um, three weeks, and an extra large might be, or maybe a large is two weeks, and an extra large might be a month. And so instead of creating a false sense of accuracy with coming up with a single number, coming up with these t-shirt sizes, and that as we move through the life of the project, anything that was medium, large, or extra large, as we get to that place in the project, right, that's the term progressive elaboration, we elaborate and we can break things that were large or extra large down into small, smaller details. So again, a simple technique um, that we can apply in any product. Okay. Hey, let's talk a little bit about information review. By the way, I, I think we, Linda and I, are guilty of having more content than we can cover. So rather, yeah. we, may, we may stop here, but we hopefully we can cover what we have up here well and conclude it. Maybe we'll do a part two. I don't know. Information review. We've talked about this a lot already. Being able to visually demonstrate things it can also be a very effective way of introducing stati uh, status today. You have something text-wise, something graphical, et cetera. Tell the story in pictures. We mentioned that before. And there's another piece in here. I've been seeing some people scroll some things by with different tools, like Lino that can do online sticky notes, et cetera, et cetera. Don't underestimate the value of low-tech, high-touch. Sticky notes that are put on a board and people are able to move them around, et cetera, has an extremely high value in the level of engagement individuals have. And they can actually go in and take the sticky note and move them, review them, et cetera. So the information radiator is just that. It's presenting information. It can be a lot of different pieces. Owned by the, the other thing with the information radiator is it gives you a chance to highlight the blockers.
And by the way, at the bottom, if anybody does look at this or get the notes or whatever, we'll talk about that. It does have a link to a, a website that's really good at defining this better. So Linda, unless you have something to add, go to the next. Burn charts, we're familiar with burn charts. Uh, basically, they are giving an idea of how much work needs to be done and how much work, work has been done. I'm going to do a quick little antidote here. Um, for John Stenbeck, you might know John Stenbeck. He's written several books on the Agile, but uh, his story is we started out when we were first doing it, doing burn down charts, which is basically saying how much work there is left to be done, um, et cetera. As they started expanding, getting more involvement of different team members, they brought in uh, different parts of the business. And the marketing people they brought in had this mindset that any chart that has a negative slope, in other words, it goes downward from left to right, is perceived as bad. So even though on a burn down chart it's good as you get more towards the bottom, et cetera, just the fact that the slope was negative it was perceived as bad. So what do we do as an in, in industry or whatever? We just flipped it around and came up with the burn up chart. So now what we're doing is we're showing total work and work that has been completed. So it's now has a positive slope and starts to go upwards. You know, think about that. What a what an amazing concept that not just what the data is, how I present it, and dealing with the cognitive biases coming. So I think the rule of thumb now for the most part is burn up charts are used at the retrospective or release planning level, burn charts or day-to-day, -day, daily meeting type level. But those are again, visual ways of being able to display what work is agreed to and what our amount of completion is of that work. Okay, next one. Agile teams measure, and this is just another example of, of a burn chart. Uh, let's, let's go on. We'll try and get to some of these graphs. Take questions. We're going to just jump through some of these real quick for you so they can Kanban see them. board or Kanban board. I'm, I'm so guilty of calling it Kanban. I don't know why. I'm just guilty as charged. It's a mental block. Uh, what can I say? And, but that whole concept there is that has to deal with different phases of where work efforts are. You know, there's this full left-hand column, which is kind of like a backlog, work that needs to be done, refrigerator, I've heard tons of terms, but it's what we know needs to get done. Then you pull it out and you start working it, then different phases of the work where it's done. And here, this example, you know, unit test, then the development's done, system test, done, done, and then deliver to the customer. But it's just, it works from a left to right on what work is sitting there and what phase is it in and being delivered. So I think I'm the version of a visual planning board. Yeah. Um, why don't we go to the last slide? And our email addresses are on there that people can send us questions. I want, to, I want to walk through these real quick so everyone has access to them. We just talked yep. about building an agile mindset, installing the key concepts, um, suggesting your leadership style. There's the service leader concept, right? And then really getting ready for implementation. Um, identify techniques, meeting with leadership, onboarding your team, and reflecting and learning along the way. All right. So if we jump to the end, go ahead, Dave. Let's open it to questions. And I guess Q and A. I, I don't know if I've seen anything in the Q and A. Okay, Brian. I think that pretty much wraps it up, um, and that's good for me in Thank terms you. of that we generate for um, for our Hopin platform, so that should work. Thank you. Thank you all for hanging in there. Um, again, as I mentioned in chat, you'll get an email from the chapter email probably about a week. We'll include a PDF of this material so that you have something to reference back to, as well as instructions for reporting your um, credits to the PMI. Thank you again and looking forward to seeing you all next month. We're going to have a speaker talk about crucial conversations. Take care. Thanks, Brian. <laughs>